just being dead for 10 seconds. Like everything is just gone. We're in Kalispell, Montana. It's in the Flathead Valley. It's just really available. You can go out back and get a bag of dope, you know? It's just so prevalent here that it's the drug to do. And it's not just us punk teenagers. A lot of people are doing this. I can't even feel my fist. Yeah. Holy shit. Some good shit, Crystal. Holy fucking A. Yeah. It's the best feeling in the world. Yeah, it's just, it's like the biggest head rush in the world. Like, you can't hear for a little bit. You can't breathe. Can't see. You can't see. People don't understand how we could get addicted to this, but I feel so good right now, better than any any sober person has ever felt their whole entire life. That's what they don't know. Who got this stuff? Well, me, Graham, and Kenny were all together. How much did that cost? Fifty dollars. How much? Fifty dollars. I think you're good, dude. I used to be a strong, athletic kid. I was, I, I run the mile. Now I run a block. <laughs> I'm You're tired, tired. so. I have, I have stretch marks on my back from, I lost like 30 pounds. It's, it's hardcore. I'm like, my, my muscle tone, it, it, it eats your muscle. But this all happened in like the first month, if that. That it just drastically affected my body like that. When was the last time you got hot? This afternoon. I purchased a gram and yeah, I smoked quite a bit of it. Not even a high. It's just, it's an addiction. This is like thirty-five dollars worth, which mm -hmm. you can't normally get, but. <laughs> and that'll get everybody <laughs> high for how long? Um, actually, this will get them one bowl, and this will give me one shot. It's all you can think about. You don't have any other priorities in life. If you're doing this stuff, you don't have aspirations to be anything else but a user. That, that's all you end up to be. Because that's what exactly what it does. It just makes you want to use more and more and more. I mean... I was doing fine. I had a job, you know, I had a really nice truck, everything. My truck got repoed. I got kicked out of my apartment. I was fired, you know, just, and it happened so quick. You don't even, you don't even have a chance to realize it happened until it's already there. What are you doing there, Crystal? I'm putting it in the spoon. Why? Because I'm going to cook it. But I don't even bother smoking. Understand. Yeah, you can't even get high for smoking. This is never the same. Yeah, smoking yeah. After. What are you doing there? Dissolving it. I was under the impression that that, that that was done to boil the impurities away. Poor shit. The whole thing is an impurity. <laughs> oh, man.
you take it and take the risks with whatever the heck happens. Yeah. Well, I'm, I gotta look in a mirror, man. I can't see. Oh, you're still in the neck, buddy. I burst the two veins in my arms before, so. Biggest vein? Three grams, four grams a day. Big shots, like half a gram for one shot. And then let's keep going on and on. I was a perfectly fine person. I was skipped ahead in school. I joined the military. I did everything right. First day I was back in Montana from the military. First person that I met offered me it. And that's when I started. <laughs> that's a head rush. It, I can't even describe. It's a horrible head rush. It's just a poor way of self-medication, basically. It's just a way to hide your feelings. When I look in the mirror, I am disgusted with myself. I'm ashamed. There's... I don't know what happened to myself. I lost her. wasn't a druggie in high school or anything like that. I just happened to be at a party one time where they had it and I was willing to try it because everybody else did. Um, more of a peer pressure type deal. Before meth, I had a ton of friends. I was outgoing. You know, I ran six miles every day. I had the trust from people. I was very well liked in my community. Um, meth took all that away from me. Meth takes su such control over you, and it's something that your body feels it needs, and you're going to do anything and be willing to do anything to get it. I would sleep with men for meth, um, mainly my dealers and stuff like that, or my boyfriend would put me out there to sleep with men for meth. After doing a shot of meth, the main thing to do afterwards was have hard sex. Um, whether it be them tying you up on the bed and pouring candle wax over your vaginal area to put you through pain, the guys got off on that. You know, using knives to cut you in any part of your body just to make little slits. Taking bigger objects towards your vaginal area, objects that shouldn't have been there. One instance is they used a bat at one point. Baseball bat? Yeah. Yeah. When I look at myself in the mirror, you know, without clothes on, and I see those scars, yes, it, it brings up, it brings up all the memories, you know, all the horrific things that were done, all the horrific things that I agreed to do. Why does it happen? Trying to get your next fix. There's no shame when it comes to this stuff. You know, you lose a lot of what you are as a person. You know, pretty much everybody I know who who's involved with dope is all thieving, lying, lying, cheating, and stealing. That's all it is. This is my kitchen. As you can see, I don't do a, uh, very much cleaning. Oh, this is uh, just dirty dishes. That's one of my bicycles. And I have a dog, and um, there ain't a yard for him to run around in. Some days it gets pretty bad. You become uncivilized. If my grandma came here and seen, seen my house looking like this, she'd kick my ass. Like when, I, when I go to my grandma's house up in Rocky Boy, I do nothing but clean and help her cook and yeah, she she beat me. But in my eyes, this is a normal life. The dope game is pretty much the only thing I know. I've been doing it as long as I can remember. And I, I don't know very many other people when they're 11, 12 years old rolling around with a pocket full of dope and as much money as I'd shit. 
I wish I could still be 12 years old and have the money and dope I had now. But I, I know it's all going to come to an end and it's all going to come crashing down and I'm going to be going to jail for it. They think when you get like this, you think that's the only way of life there is out there and it's not. It's not, you don't exist. I lived in my bedroom for the past six years. You don't exist. You really don't. Shut yourself out. My dope. Cause I always came first and my girls didn't mean nothing to me. The dope meant more. And pretty much after her kids got taken away from yeah. her, she just kind of went on a downward spiral and then it's like ever since they got taken away, it's been one big haze for her. Just one, yeah, one, <laughs> one big long stretch of just getting high constantly. Yeah. They were just, they wanted a mom and I wasn't the mom. I mean, I, I want to have a normal life with Gwen. But it's hard to get out of that life because it's easy money. It's, um... Get rich quick. Some, some baggies right here. Which, like to put your drugs in these to sell them. How much, how much stuff do you move? I like to use. This right here is a loker. This is what you put your meth in. There's some meth, crystal meth, devil's dandruff, what I like to call it. That was a uh, $25 that I just smoked up right there in about five or six hits. It was pretty much worthless because now it's just about gone and You're now okay. I want more. And it's just pure evil. And I hate myself for just doing it right now. But that ain't going to stop me from doing more. Uh, if I remember who gave it to me the first time I did it, I, I'd probably want to shoot him. first time that they used methamphetamine, they're in big trouble. Methamphetamine jazzes the nervous system. This is, everything is sped up. Heart rate, blood pressure. You know that the, everybody knows the term fight or flight. <gasps> this, the first time I take methamphetamine, I can have a stroke or I can have a heart attack. Clearly, if you're a middle-aged person using meth, you're just like Russian roulette. And if you're using big-time stimulants, that can even kill a young, healthy college athlete. For people who smoke or inject methamphetamine, it's going to hit the brain very quickly, within seconds. It's an ecstasy unlike any other drug. It works on the neurotransmitter dopamine, causes dopamine to just dump into the synapse, start charging all the cells around it, and it causes an incredibly fast euphoric rush. This is very much like the euphoria that people get with orgasms. In addition to dropping all of that dopamine out, it then gets into the cell and explodes the vesicles that carry dopamine. So eventually then, any pleasure that a person feels who's using the drug, they're only getting it from the drug. Their body ceases to be able to create that sense of pleasure. People want that feeling again. People often are self-medicating, trying to get out of their depression. I'm a Chippewa Cree from Rocky Boy Reservation. Everything is totally different up there. And there's just some traditions that you stick to, like elders and stuff but people respect the elders a lot you know and stuff like that but most of them you know ain't traditional indians they don't stick to the traditional ways in the 30 years that i've been teaching we've had problems with drinking using pot but i've never seen it escalate in such a hurry Meth is more dangerous. It's so easy to get on the reservation, and it's cheap. 
young kids can get their hands on it, I'm afraid we're going to have a tribe full of zombies. Uh, it, it's just, it's just so sad. Methamphetamine is an epidemic on this reservation. I don't think the Crow Nation can stand by and lose a generation of its young people. This methamphetamine use is killing us. We have to realize that. Our kids have to realize that. You know, I look, I look back on history and I look at, you know, how our tribe has been put on reservations and smallpox and things like that, but it didn't wipe out our reservation. This has been the worst, and just experiencing it personally, I mean, I know how terrible it is. I know how hard it is to kick the habit. My biggest regret from using, from using meth has been what I've, what I've done to my children and to my family. When my mother was on meth, it was tough trying to take care of my two brothers. Me and him, when we were younger, my mom and dad would leave us at the mall from the morning till the evening till closing, just so they could do their, do meth. There's one thing I want you to know. You know, I had one son. Four years ago, February 17th, I lost my son. He got in a real bad car accident, but it was because of methamphetamine use, and that hurts me. You know, I don't want other parents to go through what I go through every day thinking about the son I had, my only son. I should have been more close to him. I should have said, son, I love you. Let's get together. Let's take care of this problem together. I didn't do that. I should have done that. People need to know what their kids are doing. They need to be involved with their kids. I, I really could not imagine a world without our tribe in it because um, initially, I guess I, I think about my children <laughs> and their children's children. I'm hoping that Native Americans and the white society in the state of Montana if they could just come together and work together to save all our children in getting rid of this plague that's upon us, maybe we can, we can beat it. I, I lie to my mom, I, I spend way too much money, I do things I shouldn't do, I, it's, eventually you just do things to get money, and this is where all your money goes towards, like, I could have so much stuff right now, just the amounts of money I spend on drugs, and people you owe, and people I owe, I've heard a lot of things about people doing degrading and embarrassing things. I never did anything sexual for drugs, but I watched I watched other girls do it all the time. They would or or guys mostly because one of the biggest connections around here just happens to be a gay pedophile. So if you're a young boy and you want to get high over to his house, 
I don't know, maybe he'll just sit there and he'll jack off in front of you and he'll give you a, a ball for it. I was playing with my 10-month-old nephew down on the floor and I had a couple of eight balls of meth in my pocket. And when I left, I got back into town and I realized that I was missing one of them. And all I could worry about was where my drugs were at. Um, at that point, I went back to the house to see if I could find the eight ball of meth laying on the floor somewhere without my mom noticing. And when I got there, she told me to leave and the cops were on their way because my nephew had hum picked it up and it almost swallowed it. I needed to get high, so I was robbing a bunch of people's houses. And this guy woke up when I was in his house and I'd smash his face. The guy had stitches from one side of his face down to the other side of his face. And all I was worried about was getting high and getting away. I just see prison for him. I mean, uh, the stunts he's been pulling and that, I mean, I, I'm afraid to come home sometimes. Right there on my head, I had my head cracked open with a baseball bat. Somebody thought I had some dope. I've had people actually can come down and shoot me just because he's been ripping people off. Methods really uh, made him a demon. I'd do just about anything for drugs, like steal from my own dad, my brother. And I'm, I'm glad I don't have no kids because I'd probably rob them of their futures. I'd sell myself if I had to. Not, not to a guy, though. No. <laughs> Why is he still alive? Uh, why well, they call him Weasel. Tell me why. He's just a uh, crafty, sly, and he just has dodged a bullet. It's going to catch up with him. identified the Cascade County as a high-intensity drug trafficking area. We work dope 24-7. That's all we do right now with the emphasis on meth because it's our biggest problem. Last week, we did a series of drug busts. It's going to be a CI buy at the Lido. Here's a picture of our friendly. There you go there, tough guy. A couple was in a motel room and had some meth or narcotics in their room. We located some marijuana, cash, methamphetamine, some scales, some paraphernalia. Can you hear me now? Yeah. See you there. Uh, so they were selling out of their room. We gave them the option not to go to jail today. And uh, to help law enforcement out, we had them call some of their suppliers and also some of their customers. Well, let me, let me, let's call Chris. Just play the game. Oh, why, do you know where to get anything? No, do you know where to get any dope? Let me say about 15 minutes. We would take them down. You called us up and ordered up dope. You got caught. Game over. Thank you know you, you had meth on you. You know you came and tried to buy dope. Okay. Who's the dude? You really have to help yourself out here. Okay, I want you to engage in some conversation with him. Okay. I was waiting for him. On the ground. Turn around, police officer. On your stomach. <laughs> Paula was kind of... She's obviously an addict, but she was wrong place at the wrong time the night of our bust. Arrested me, handcuffed me, and I gave him all the stuff that I had on me. <clears throat> Who else is slinging dope in my town? The whole town of Great Falls is slinging dope. I know, but I can't arrest the whole town. I can't write out a complaint against the town of Great Falls. Um, pretty much you damn near arrested half the people that are the main hookups in town. Okay, well, who's the other half then? <sighs> Local law enforcement alone will not stop the meth problem in Montana. We can barely make a dent in it um, without the public's help. And again, going after the demand for meth, um, it's going to be a continuous problem.
Um, my mom helped me get into another apartment. Um, she got me a car. I borrowed so much money from her. Couldn't keep my own jobs, and my car broke down. I got evicted. I realized my little brother was watching me go from, you know, 190 pounds to 150 in a matter of months. N never seemed to sleep. <laughs> Gone for weeks at a time. Just appeared for a little bit to, I don't know, maybe get food or get something else out of the house I could pawn. My parents made me give my dogs away. I don't even have nothing, no responsibility whatsoever. I don't do anything. Just <laughs> float by, I suppose. It's not just teenagers. It's not just your early 20s. It's women as well as men, but women who have children. What it is doing to that environment. <laughs> I think one of the most outrageous effects of methamphetamine is the total disregard that these addicts have for their families. When I would call there, call at April's house, the kids were answering the phone, oh mom's in the bedroom, let me go get her. All I wanted to do was meth. At first I didn't think she was because I wasn't seeing the effects. I wasn't seeing the dramatic weight loss. I had a very good job and then I picked up meth and it went downhill from there. I started dealing meth and found that it made a lot quicker money than working. Nobody was working and there was money. And I kept saying, April, it better not be what I think it is and it's no mom, no, it's not going on. I had just separated from my ex-husband and I was down and thought that it might bring me up. Yeah, brought me up for a while and then I came crashing down. One of the methamphetamine pipes was found in a children's toy, correct? Yes. There was a substantial risk of death or serious bodily injury to your children? Yes, sir. And the defendant is convicted thereon of the offense of criminal endangerment of felony as alleged in count three of the information. When I found out for sure that April and her boyfriend were using meth a lot, I became very, very angry with her. Every conversation was a fight. What the hell are you doing? If you choose to go do drugs, then that will be your choice. But I will take your children away from you for their safety. There was a stabbing at my house, he got stabbed in the face by men that had kicked in my front door over 14 grams. And then two weeks later, there was a, a shooting. No, I don't belong in jail. Somebody said she was nothing but a predator. I think anybody who has children, if they do not have that instinct to protect, then they shouldn't be a parent to begin with. And I don't care if they're four or if they're 40, when somebody calls your child a predator, it hurts. It hurts. That's pretty good. You don't get none. You quit. I'd like to think we're pretty close and get pound me. Yeah, it crystallized up nice, too. Yeah, it cracked back nice. Yeah, it, it tastes like really dopey. Because us, we don't just all we have is each other, but it seems like we've all drifted way apart. I mean, my daughter doesn't want my granddaughter around me because of him, and also because of his, you know, effect on me. Here, write this light. Write the match for me. My brother and my sister, so. they both got good lives and they both got good things going for them. And my dad did raise me good. He taught me right from wrong and he gave me the choices and I made the choices myself and I, I made the wrong choices because I'm like him. It's like he made the wrong choices. This, this is really killing my girlfriend right now. She really wants to try some of it. But I'm not going to let her. One is because I'm stingy and two is because she's too good to do it. 
to, s to see that cloud of smoke. Please. I don't want to get high. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. Yeah, I can no. do it. I'll piss you off worse if I let you. No, you won't. Ice is the best when you're pregnant. I went through foster homes basically my whole life, so I really never was taught anything about drugs. I just knew that my mom was a user. The night I first got high, it was a conscious decision. I was going out that night to get high. <laughs> Me and my first kid's dad broke up. I found out he was cheating on me, and when I took my first hit of meth, it was powerful. It made everything kind of go away, everything that I was thinking about. But that first high is the only really good high that you get. You never feel as good as you did. The whole rest of the time you're using, you're just chasing that first high. And when the people in your life are worried about you, and you hear people talking about how upset your family or your friends are, they're the enemy because I looked at it like I wasn't hurting anybody, not even myself, because it seemed like anything that made me feel so good, you know, couldn't hurt. I don't steal from people. I'm not scandalous. I sing. I'm talented, you know. And then when I'm on meth, it's not anything you think about at all, like how quickly you're going downhill. Within six or seven months, my electricity was off. My house was just filthy. I was neglecting my child because you just can't connect with your kids when you're high, you know? I've had two previous pregnancies and it was never a problem for me not to use. And it was just weird how this time I didn't, it's like I couldn't control it. I wasn't thinking, what would I do if this meth would blow up my baby's heart? You know, I wasn't thinking about how f fucked up it would be if my baby died inside of me. I would just, I worried about it, and that just drove my, that just drove me to get high more. Because you don't want to think about it. And then what if I would have killed my baby, you know, to get high? I'm not, I mean, that's not me at all. I'm thinking I, I just can't even believe I did it. I can't believe I used meth at all in my pregnancy. If you look at these are the ingredients. Iodine, charcoal lighter, red devil lye, hydrogen peroxide, heat we pour in our gas tanks, Drano or drain cleaner. The only ingredient here that is not a deadly poison is the Sudafed. And people are shooting this stuff into their circulatory system and consequently into their brain. This was an exhibit in a, in a trial. These were found in the trunk of his car and it included this uh, butane stove. And he could go out into the national forest uh, very isolated and cook the meth there. And he's not the only one doing this. He's one that we caught.
All rise. District Court is now in session. The Honorable Ted Lippis presiding. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> The first matter is on the calendar of the state of Montana in count one. Meth is a factor in 80% of the cases. Uh, either, the, either in cases involving possession, manufacture, or sale or distribution of meth, or cases involving behavior as a consequence of meth. We first saw methamphetamine five years ago on a very, very minor scale. Within the last two years, we've seen a tidal wave of meth use hit here in Montana. Today, I would say 80 to 85 percent of the people in the jail have some involvement with methamphetamine. Like the pod I'm in right now, you're looking forward to getting beat up, getting checked out to know if you're a snitch or not, you know. They're going to be hitting when they're checking, so... Basically, you're coming into a, a whole different world when you come into the, the jail. You know, in here, it's kind of like a jungle, you know what I mean? You know, if you're like a rat, you know, boom, you know, you, hey, you could deal with them. If you're talking to the cops, you know, and just give them names and shit, boom, you know, you, hey, you could deal with, you know, broken arms, you get thrown out, hey, um, you get thrown out like the top tier, just any, anything, you know. The guards can't watch after you all the time. There's mean people here. They're going to make you do things that you don't want to do. They'll call you a faggot all the time. Um, you could become homosexual. You can become uh, somebody's bitch. A bitch is somebody that will get stripped down and they will rape you in jail. They will, they will do, they will rape you in jail. They will. Hey, you come here with money, they're gonna took. And if they like that ass, they're gonna take your ass too, you know? Like John Latre, he's not a very nice person, you know? You don't, you don't want to become somebody's bitch. <laughs> you don't. It's, it's no good. In Montana, women using meth is a big problem. Not that men isn't, but they frequently will start out thinking it's a good way to lose weight. Two thirds of the women in our state prison are there for meth. All young females are looking for acceptance um, they're looking in the wrong places here. And once they get sucked into this culture, um, it seems to be incredibly difficult to get away from it. I graduated high school with honors. I had a scholarship to USC, a sports scholarship. I chose drugs over that scholarship, a boyfriend. Um, and I lost so much of my life because of that. I'm a 16-time convicted felon. Before I started selling drugs, I would sell myself for drugs. I would, would do anything for the drug. Um, sex, blowjobs, um, things like that. I didn't look at it as a prostitute because I'd never received money. I just, just received drugs. So basically I was a prostitute for drugs instead of money. Um, I was queen of a rodeo my senior year in high school. I didn't graduate high school. I was short credits to graduate because of my addiction. The crowd I was hanging out with, they were the older kids, you know. They were the seniors in high school. They were, you know, they were the popular kids. I wanted to fit in, and they handed me a line, and they said, you know, it feels great. You'll never want to go back. And I never did. You know, I mean, you, you think you have all this time in the world, but you don't, because then you end up here. And then if you're looking at time. The extent that I would go to masking my year analysis, I would drink bleach. I used to get high only on weekends. Come Friday, I would drink bleach, go do my urinalysis for my probation officer, and walk out of there smiling and ready to do another loaded rig, loaded needle full of dope. It's just the insanity of it. And you would think, after feeling that way, that you won't go back to it. That just makes you want it even that much more. Because then you kind of start liking the insanity of it and you find comfort in it because it's familiar territory for you. I was so spun. I sat for over a day on my butcher block in my kitchen with a machete in one hand, a knife in the other, on my tiptoes.
the disease of methamphetamine use is addiction. That's the disease. The secondary manifestation of methamphetamine use, people can become Parkinsonian, problems with movement, problems with facial expression, problems with tremor. The meth is, affects the meth, changed my whole speech and everything. It, I can't, it gave me like a lisp kind of thing, sort of. It's like, it's like, it won't come out as clear as it should. I don't know, it's chemicals or something, did it? It's changed my whole body. It ruins you for good. Think of, think of the talking thing, it comes like, because your jaw, it does something to your jaw. It, it's mess, it messed me up, like, it's going to be long-term effects. There's not, it probably won't go away, some of them. People who use the drug tend to continue to have negative effects, even with two years of sobriety behind them. So let's just go through your mouth real quick. Seven is missing. 23, the destruction in her mouth is catastrophic. The enamel wears away and is eaten away by the acid of the bacteria, and uh, invariably every tooth is affected. There's very little we can do often. And usually it means that we end up removing most of them, and uh, they end up with dentures at a very young age. Seven years ago, I started using really heavily. Meth has eaten them from the outside in. I will most likely lose all my teeth before I leave. Came out great. We don't have to dig for any little root tips or anything, so. It tears you down, it tears you down. It makes you so unhappy. You think it's making you happy, but it makes you so unhappy that it makes you so unhappy that the only time you're happy is when you're on it. The come down is it's horrible. The worst thing in the world is the worst depression you will ever have. All you want to do is just like slit your wrists. You just wanted to stop. Just anything. It's nothing to make you feel happy. There's no comfort anybody can give you. When I see Crystal shoot up, the, the main thing that goes through my mind is um, what is she doing? She, she had such, you know, such a promising career in front of her. She did top placement in her classes and you know all of her courses to be certified for police officer and then she just ruined it for a bit of powder. Where I'm right now is, uh, he has his whole life ahead of him, but I really don't think he's gonna make it that far if he keeps doing what he's doing. He's uh, dropped out of school, got in trouble with the police, pretty much revolves around getting high now. He never looks at you straight anymore. He's always moving around like his face and always doing weird stuff. He's spun most of the time, and I really haven't seen him sober a whole lot. Graham's use started with, uh, even if you were charged, first you time with Johnny in his bedroom, you know, walked in on Johnny when he was smoking and and uh, got high with him and pretty much took off from there. The next day he comes to me and says, hook me up again, man. I said, oh, we got a little fiend, do we? You know, and I gave him a lot of hell and I made fun of him and called him a fiend and a junkie. And I made him feel like a real, real asshole, actually. But I still hooked him up. One day, some people got a hold of Johnny, told him that, that they banged Graham. They shot him up. I said, you shot up Graham? Do you know how fucking old he is? And he's all, yeah, dude. I'm pretty sure that kid's going to be a junkie, man. Graham was only 15 at the time, and, you know, he's already banging, and that's just the beginning of the end for anybody. Can you look at it, Chief? Flash. Uh, <laughs> you can't look at it when it's happening? No, I don't like to. Tell me what you're feeling. Much better. <laughs> I don't know, I'm like Tim. I don't, I don't like to look at it. Everything's pretty much gone downhill from there. If he keeps doing this, he will be dead before he reaches 30. Just because of, of how quickly it escalates and then how fast your tolerance builds up. I don't expect Graham to have the character to turn it around and figure his life out. I expect him to overdose on meth.
and I don't want my kids to know this. This is the reason of my accident because of the meth. Yeah, I did try to commit suicide. Meth had to do with the depression, and if I hadn't been depressed, I wouldn't have been out there driving like I was, and I, would, I, I wouldn't have thought of committing suicide, and I went as fast as I could. I was probably doing about 90. I just I cranked it in the ditch as hard as I could, and I had hit a tree. Um, I knew at that point I couldn't move my legs. I mean, I knew right now. I knew it. If I can help one child out of this, I will. I'm sorry. I just I look at my own kids and, my gosh, if they ever tried it, I would, oh. I just, I never want to see my children do this. Ever. And I don't care whose child it is, you know, if I can help <clears throat> one child, it would be all worth it. I probably wouldn't be clean for meth today had the law not stepped in and forced me to go to treatment. I went in and out of jail so many times and that never seemed to work. Um, it took me going to an inpatient treatment center and I'm on my second or third outpatient treatment center right now. Please? Court is in session, you may be seated. This is TC05-6. I've been a part of the treatment court program for a little over a year now. It's an 18 month program. How are you? And it's been difficult, but it's gave me a life that I once had. What would be your alternative? Prison. I've got four or five felonies on my record right now, so that's where I would have gone. What is a very critical component to the program is the relationship that the judge has with the participants, because this is all about accountability and responsibility. So what happened to your job? I lost it. Why? Because I went to jail. And... For what other reason? For drinking. There's been lots of consequences because of that decision, has there? Yes, there has. So what are you doing? I'm looking for another job. You have to have a job. You can't just be sitting around. I understand that. I became judge in 1997. Before then, I was the prosecutor in this county for 14 years. I wasn't in favor of this program in the beginning. I thought this is one of those touchy-feely kinds of mm -hmm. programs. I have the opportunity to see these people weekly or every other week to go through their whole recovery program with them. And I'm going to let you go to work. It's the accountability. Them having to come here and confront me, not only about the good things that they've done, but about the bad decisions that they've made and to accept responsibility for that. When there's a violation, there's an immediate consequence. I understand we have a problem here this morning. We recognize that a person who is in recovery probably will relapse. Well, you used and you lied. There's no hearing. There's no delay. There's an immediate consequence. So you're going, I'm going to send you to jail for 24 hours. Then you could be sitting over there for 18 months if you don't get through this. And there's also rewards when they're doing well. You have been in this program six months sober. But look at what you've done. You can just list them all off. You have a place of your own to live. You have a good job, a steady job. You're much less fidgety. Yeah. <laughs> we compliment them. We praise them. We applaud them. What does the blue chip symbolize? I see the blue skies ahead, but I'm still going to have blue days. Six months of sobriety. Well, I'm very grateful that you're here this morning. So here's the ear, ear chip.
we set Graham up, took Graham to his little dinner and had the cops arrest him at our dinner table. Oh, yeah, well, you know, you had to get him nice. safe. So then Graham got to get out of jail free because, oh yeah, they ran out of space. So the effort, it took me to get him to a safe spot. I got called how many days later, Graham? Because they were crowded. So that's the help you get. Um, he's been stuck to me for 24-7 for the last six weeks. He goes to work with me in the morning, goes to lunch with me. We tuck him in, we give him a sleepy time tea. I've been better. I've been going a lot of counseling and probation and a lot of stuff. So this is all overwhelming. <laughs> I haven't talked to anybody. I don't associate with anyone anymore. And it just it hasn't come up. You take a kid that's a straight-A student that can't even stay in a classroom now, um, that is more interested on numbing himself than living life, has some kind of preconceived notion in his brain that it's a lot easier to go that route versus reality. I mean, he is, he doesn't mean to be, it's not him, but he's become deceitful, he lies about the tiniest little things, I, it's, I don't know. I don't know. You said that you only used it four times? That's what you said. So what does that mean? That you don't use it as much? You use it? You don't use it? I don't use it anymore at all. You don't use it anymore at all? No, but I, I did do it more than four, four times. And so you haven't used meth for how long? A couple of months, like I said. How do you do that? How do you give up, from what I hear, one of the most addictive things on this planet? How do you, how do you give that up? It's not as manip manipulative as you think. It's, it's not. I have my doubts. How could I not? How do you just use something and then just give it up? Something that's that powerful something that made him do things that he would never do. So I don't know. Is that possible? I mean, w what are we left with? I mean, I don't have the tools it takes. I don't have what it takes. I, you know, help! There will come a time where I'm tired. And when you turn 18, you'll look at me, and if he's still doing this, he'll say, you know, I'm 18, I'm going to do what I want. And then what? Then what do I have? So I have a little bit more time if I have to play the jailer 24-7. That's what I'm going to do. How does it all end? Yeah, I don't know. You tell me how does it all end. My, my body is nothing compared to what it was before. For instance, my thermostat in my body, I can, I'm never warm. I, I just, I can't get really close to people because I know people are capable of. I know what I was capable of. The, the most consistent thing I've heard about meth is that meth is the devil. That's the most consistent thing I've heard about every person. Even the people that are still using that will tell you meth's the devil, and then they'll do it anyways. But I guess I'm just in such a disbelief, it's so hard to even project how you feel with such a devastating thing. I don't know. I, it's horrible. I, I, how do you... How do you tell people how crappy it is. You can't tell people. It's, you just don't understand. You just gotta finally take somebody's word for it that it's shitty, it's gonna fuck up your life, so why even try in the first place? But I think about that now, I'd shoot myself in the head before I ever touch that shit again in my life. <laughs>